Well, hello everybody. My name is Kyle Roseboom. Uh, like Wayne uh, told you, I teach in the animal science department. Uh, I also serve as uh, the livestock judging team coach. So I get to travel uh, throughout the United States and get a chance to, to see and, and learn about a lot of the higher quality sheep flocks in the United States. And I uh, teach the sheep for the senior level sheep production class here in our department. And I am the faculty supervisor for our small uh, sheep flock we have here on campus. And you're gonna hear from Whitney. Dr. Whitney's our, our uh, campus veterinarian. So she'll share some really good information too. But my experience in sheep, I grew up out in Western Minnesota and my family had a small flock of Suffolk, uh, registered Suffolks that we would show uh, quite a bit. And then now uh, my experience here on campus working with the university sheep flock. So I'm gonna share a lot of uh, probably a personal information that I have. And, and I completely understand that raising sheep is a really diverse industry. And there's certainly a lot of different ways to do things and, and do things well. But I'll just share what we kind of do on campus and give you a little bit of background that, that we try to uh, follow so we can uh, have good reproductive success within our flock. So if you have any questions, uh, they'll be monitoring the the chat and the questions and feel free to at any time uh, to uh, to ask a question and stop me as we go up, uh, as we go along. So just a little background. I, I'm sure a lot of you are going to be familiar with this information um, and hopefully we can kind of get together and try to come up with ways to improve our reproductive rates. But just a little bit about the background of sheep and goats and I'll try to hit on both. I do have a little bit experience with boar goats when I taught at another school, we had a herd of boar goats there, but a lot of my information uh, is from a sheep background. So, but I'll try to touch on both tonight for you all. Um, if you look at some of the, just the, the, the inherent characteristics of sheep and goats, they're little, they're much alike, but there's some things that are a little bit different. And those differences may play a role later on in the slide presentation in how we maybe will develop some um, techniques or how we may set up different parts of our program. But sheep and goats, 99% of the time are, you can kind of almost treat them the same and do a lot of the same things. But you see that the estrus cycle of a goat is slightly longer and the length of time that she's in heat, the does in heat is slightly longer. So if you decide to use an AI program, decide to synchronize a goat or a doe versus a ewe, your timing will be just slightly different. You'll extend a, your, your timing of mating just a little bit longer, just because a goat's heat cycle is slightly longer. Goats tend to come into puberty just a little bit earlier than sheep. And so some producers may breed their uh, does just a little bit younger than they may select to breed their ewe lambs because they are a little more early in their maturity pad and a little quicker to puberty. Uh, but for the most part, 99% uh, uh, of the management practices are, are very much similar between the two. So we talked a little bit about uh, some background in our U reproductive management. All of you are familiar with uh, the term short day breeders, um, and that certainly plays a big part in how we go about thinking um, to set up a reproductive management program for sheep. I'm familiar uh, quite a bit with the blackface breeds, having been around Suffolk and Hampshire's, and, and they more times than not are short day breeders, but there are specialty breeds out there your Dorsets, your Fans, and your Romanoffs that you certainly can use them and breed them uh, at different times of the year and have certainly have good success. But decreasing the hour of daylight will definitely, uh, as the days become shorter, you'll get higher estrus, uh, you'll get higher ovulation rates, and that's why we always tend to breed our sheep in the fall. There are good sp um, spring breeding operations I was, uh, I've been familiar with and have been lucky to be around that use spring synchronized breeding to get fall lambs, uh, but that's very challenging if you're dealing with a breed uh, that really isn't set up to be uh, that kind of a breeding system. So uh, definitely daylight is very important and that's why we're talking about it now because many of you uh, may be thinking about turning your bucks in here August. I know there's people already uh, in the club lamb businesses in Minnesota, there's people already breeding their ewes uh, for those December lambs, trying to get those early lambs for the show ring market, okay? Um, as we think about reproductive management, this is one of the things that uh, we consider here at the U that's really important. We like to 
try to select through our selection process, try to select those ewe lambs every year uh, that tend to be faster growing, that tend to wean off it with heavier weaning weights and tend to be bigger and stouter because there's a lot of good research out there that talks about the relationship between weaning weight of lambs uh, and growth rate of lambs and the size they come off the ewe on that relates it to lifetime produc production levels, okay? So the earlier these ewes exhibit puberty and that's highly related to their weaning weights, it's highly related to their growth rates. Uh, if they grow faster, they put on more condition, they get bigger and stronger and larger weights, they tend to come into puberty a little bit earlier and this could be especially important if you decide to have uh, a system where you're breeding those ewe lambs, okay? If you're not breeding your ewe lambs and you're gonna keep them for yearlings for their first time being bred, then maybe this trait, this correlation of traits isn't quite as important to you because maybe uh, you can grow them out from their weaning to their yearling age and get them caught up. But if you design a program where you're gonna incorporate your ewe lambs into your breeding system that next fall, selection of those lambs that are born earlier, uh, maybe your first set of ewe lambs, the lamb, ewe lambs that grew faster and grew bigger at weaning, they'll tend to be more productive uh, and stay last longer within your flock. The maximum reproduction for a ewe, she's in her, kind of in her prime between four and seven years of age. Um, and so very young ewes and very old ewes will tend to have lower reproduction rates very, very common for your ewe lambs and even yearling ewes to just have singles. And it's very, very common for your older ewes of your flock to kind of uh, peter out at the end and, and start giving you singles towards the end. So if you're selecting ewes or trying to develop a flock of ewes, um, your best reproductive rates will be between four and seven years of age. And that's a nice age to, if you want to get in the sheep business, a lot of times you can find breeders that will sell you this age of you, especially if they're um, these breeders that are kind of elite kind of breeders that want to turn over their genetics fast. Sometimes you can find them where they'll sell you those ewes between four and seven years of age uh, and you can get them for a, a really good price and, and they're still in their productive uh, years of, of uh, raising lambs. Um, like we were talking about, like I just mentioned, body weight at mating, your heavier ewe lambs will have a greater ovulation rate and will produce more lambs than thin ewes. So what we try to do in our selection process at the university is we, um, we weigh all our lambs when they're born, and then we weigh all our lambs at weaning, and we calculate an adjusted weaning weight. And we will use that then in our selection process. Uh, and so we have a small flock at the university, we have about 40 ewes. And so every year out of those 40 ewes, we may have 30 to 35 ewe lambs in the weaning pen and we'll select out of those 35, we'll select down the 15 to keep as replacement ewes. And oftentimes we lean heavier or lean towards those ewe lambs that were born earlier in the lambing season and those ewe lambs that were heavier and, and grew fast because the data shows that they'll tend to be more productive uh, throughout their lifetime. And one of the neat things we've, by keeping this data, one of the neat things we've seen is that the ewe lambs that we've kept back that were born at the beginning of the lambing season, that maybe uh, late January when we started lambing, they tend to be the ewes down the road. If you put them on a chart next to each other, they tend to be the ewes that have their lambs first when they become mothers. And so it's kind of interesting to see that the ones that are naturally more prone to, to settle and, have, and, and raise lambs earlier in the lambing season. One of the reproductive management practices that many of you have heard of and, and we, we use uh, quite a bit here at the university is, is a term called flushing. Now, if you grew up in the beef business or even in the lamb business now, but the beef business, the term flushing means uh, collecting eggs from a donor. Not, and I'll talk a little bit on my last slide about that. But flushing is a great practice in sheep as well. And they actually use it in the swine industry too. And in this in the flushing in this sense is increasing their nutrients prior to breeding. And so what we do here at the U is, is we take those U's in from pasture. And oftentimes when they come in from pasture uh, in late August, when the pastures are 
maybe running out a little bit and they're, and they're not as good. Some of our ewes actually come in off pasture maybe just a little thinner than we like. Uh, maybe a body condition score two, two and a half. But it seems like those ewes that come in at two to two and a half are maybe just are the ones that are just a little thin. They really respond well to flushing and it's been kind of showed through research studies that flushing is the most beneficial to those thin females. And what it is, is basically increasing the nutrient intake of your females. So we'll get those females up, we'll get our ewes up, and this works just as well in goats. Uh, we'll get them up about two to three weeks prior to the breeding season, and we'll start increasing their grain. We may start them out at a half a pound a day, just to get their uh, stomachs kind of acclimated back to grain, a grain diet, and then we'll increase them to a pound a day per head, and then and if we need to, we'll even go to a pound and a half. And what that does is it kind of jump starts them to think that their body is in times of uh, good, in good times. And because of that, their body uh, will start uh, feeling like, okay, I'm in good condition. My reproductive tract can kick in uh, and, and they'll generally ovulate and be a little bit more fertile, okay? So it can be done at the beginning of the breeding season. You can actually do it you can use this technique in late gestation before lambing if, you're, if you need to increase the birth rate and vigor of your lambs. Um, so flushing is generally done two to three weeks before breeding. And there's some research that says, um, I was just reading it the other day, that some people actually, it's recommended to actually continue that flushing of the higher nutrient intake even two weeks into post-breeding. Uh, and they've saw some embryo survival increases uh, by doing that, which is kind of interesting because it kind of goes against what the swine world uh, has found out uh, through their research is flushing of sows that are a little thin, it certainly works, but in the swine world, after you get a sow bred, you're actually supposed to decrease their feed intake for the first couple, three days. So kind of interesting, a little bit of difference between species. Um, now, flushing is a great thing and it works extremely well or your thinner ewes that come in a little bit thin in their condition. But if you have a bunch of ewes that are fed properly and, and are adequate in their condition, um, they usually don't respond as well to flushing. So if your females are greater than a body condition score three and a half, uh, they won't tend to respond well to flushing because their bodies are at an adequate body condition and they really feel physiologically no need uh, for that increase in nutrients to really kickstart their reproductive system. So we tend to have our ewes come in off summer pasture uh, a little thin. And because of that, our flushing, the flushing technique has really worked well for us uh, on campus. And so here's the body condition scores. And I think one thing as a sheep producer, uh, it, it's probably pretty important that you do understand body condition scores. They actually go one to five, but here's probably the three more common ranges that you're going to see. One would be uh, almost emaciated to the point where they're, they're maybe almost dead. Um, one and a half to two and a half would be kind of, one and a half to two, maybe two and a half would be kind of in a thin range. Uh, three is kind of an ideal body condition score coming in the lambing and three and a half would be really nice for coming in the lambing too. And then four, you can see how the the body condition scores work. It works on the level of fat thickness over their spinal process and even down on the side of their rib cage to transverse processes. Um, and it has a lot to do with the layer of fat over their top line. And it also has to do with the amount of muscle fullness to their loin that you feel, okay? And so coming in from the pasture in late fall, our, our ewes tend to come in around a two. Uh, We've even had some years where the pasture really kind of was dry summer and they've come in. Unfortunately, some of them have even come in at a one and a half, which gets to be uh, really a shelly kind of feel to their, to their top, almost a, a really skinny feel. And so actually though, if you can get those in and get them on a flushing diet, those use will respond really well, okay? One thing flushing doesn't really do well with or are, are, are actually as good uh, with our, our first time ewes, we've kind of found that our yearlings don't tend to flush quite as well and, and our older ewes tend not to flush quite as well. And maybe it's due to an age thing. Uh, but again, going back to the prime of their life, uh, our, our three, four and five year olds, they really respond well to flushing. And, and the research says that you'll get about a 10 to 20% increase in lambing rate. Uh, 
with the use of flushing. And I think it certainly helped our flocks. Uh, our flock, when I first took it over, we were about a 135 to 140 weaning percentage per ewe. And last spring we weaned off at 1.85 lambs per ewe. And so we're getting quite a bit more twins and even triplets now in our Hampshires, which is, which is kind of rare sometimes in those meat feeds. Uh, the feedstuffs that you can use to flush your use, um, very simple. It doesn't have to be nothing fancy. Um, we just use a kind of a, a, what we call our sheep concentrate or sheep blend. And it's just a mixture of cracked corn and soybean meal with some vitamins and mineral pack put in it. Um, there is some research out there though that you want to kind of stay away from using, uh, see your red clovers and a lot of your clovers and even some alfalfa brands because of some of the high estrogenic feed uh, levels within those diets and that can affect their fertility actually to a negative. And so we tend not to, um, to flush our use with high quality forages. We tend to use high quality feedstuffs uh, as our flushing uh, material. And then lambs and kids weaned are, are reared under poor nutrition or less productive throughout their lives. And so, you know, sometimes uh, some people like to maybe get a little tighter and maybe not uh, feed their lambs and growing lambs and kids quite as well, thinking they'll eventually catch up. Uh, but sometimes that can be a negative too. We tend to feed our ewe lambs here uh, 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 pretty good in terms of pushing them to grow fast, pushing them to stay in good condition because there's so much good research that talks about the relationship of their rearing environment with lifetime productivity. And so that's probably not the best area to kind of tighten up, a, uh, tighten up your budget. Uh, it's probably not the best place you'd want to do that. Feed your lambs and kids uh, well and, and grow them out well. They'll tend to be productive for a longer time and, and will be more productive. Another concept that some of producers utilize quite well and, and can be really a, a strong part of your reproductive management program is the use of teaser bucks, teaser rams, teaser bucks, okay? And what these animals are, are these are animals that have been more than likely surgically alterated uh, to kind of turn them into a vasectomized ram. Now the picture I'm showing you is kind of interesting. I, I've never experienced this personally, but there are in some other parts of the, of the world, they're actually using intact males that are not surgically altered and they're just normal rams, but they're putting a teaser apron on them. And so that's what you're seeing there. So if that ram would go to mount a ewe, um, he would not be able to enter and breed that ewe because of that apron that guards it. And the reason the producers are doing that is they're using their actual herd sires uh, as their teaser rams and then they'll turn them in for real breeding uh, once the teaser uh, time is up. And so that's a system you could use. Most of the producers I know um, actually go out and get their rams vasectomized and they use them as teaser bucks. And what a teaser ram is, or teaser buck, is basically uh, it's, a, it's a male you put in with those ewes two weeks prior to breeding. And what it does is it takes those ewes that are in a state of anestrus and it kind of gets them jump started. The sights, the smells, the hormonal, um, you know, inducing, it just gets those ewes going, okay? And it may help increase the ovulation rate. It may help jumpstart those anestrous ewes by the sight and the smells of the buck to get, them, uh, to get them cycling. These bucks are vasectomized, so they still have the sex drive. They'll still mount the females in heat. And I should say right here at this point, be careful though, if you are using teaser rams and teaser bucks that you still worry about disease spread. Um, in the cattle world, there's the same thing with what they call gomer bulls. And Sometimes I've heard stories of producers who share gomer bulls, and with that possibility of sharing these gomer bulls, you could share sexually transmitted diseases between your herds. And so the same thing can happen in sheep if you share teaser rams with other producers. Uh, maybe Whitney could comment on this because she's really way better expert in disease management, um, how you could possibly, you know, your biosecurity could be impaired a little bit if you're sharing teaser rams with other flocks. So it's kind of recommended uh, most time that you just use teaser rams that you've developed 
within your flock. So you put those teaser rams in a pen with your ewes. No more than two weeks prior to the start of breeding is ideal because if they're in there any longer, the ewes will get accustomed to it. You're not gonna get that shock value that you get uh, when you put a new buck in there. And generally what'll happen is those ewes, if they are in a state of anestrus, and even if they're not, sometimes they have kind of a silent heat about two to three, four days after you put those teaser rams in. And then once that silent heat goes through, then the next heat, 14 to 17 days later, usually will be a strong fertile heat. And by that time, you're ready to put your, your real bucks in there, the bucks you're actually gonna use for a breeding season. And so this is used a lot of times uh, to jumpstart a set of ewes, maybe move them up breeding wise and timing wise. And in the AI and the embryo transfer uh, portion of the embryo industry, those breeders that are using AI and embryo transfer, uh, they'll use teaser rams to allow them uh, to know when to AI those ewes or uh, to get ready for AI or embryo transfer. You can put a marking harness on these bucks as well to give you a good idea of how many of you use, what percentage of your ewes are actually cycling, cycling in the flock. Um, one more thing, uh, I was trying to remember about teaser rams. Um, when you, use, when you use a teaser ram, and Whitney's gonna talk about BSEs later, but it's also recommended that when you, when you make a teaser ram, let's say you get a veterinarian to come out and make you a teaser ram, make sure you have that teaser ram semen checked before you put them in there. And this would be the semen check that you want a ram to fail. This is the one you don't want them to pass because sometimes you never know what happens. And so uh, always have your teaser ram semen checked uh, to make sure that he, he's not able to produce viable semen. Kyle? Yep. We have a question. So sure. when using a teaser buck, does it matter if the buck can actually mount? I know a lot of breeders using pygmy bucks on Bordeaux. Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, we actually don't do much with teaser rams here at the U just for a safety concern with students, but um, my personal feeling would be no. I think the sights and the sounds and the stinkiness of the buck would certainly be enough to stimulate their, their response. Um, you know, there is some interesting data though that comes out from the cattle industry, and I can just relate this, that these gomer bucks are gomer bulls that they were using that actually can penetrate the cow and deposit seminal fluid um, without, seam, without sperm cells, but seminal fluid. There is some research that talks about higher conception rate in those females come breeding, which I think is really interesting. Um, so going back to the question, does it matter if the pygmy can actually mount and penetrate uh, and go through the the normal mating process, I don't know that answer for sure. I don't know if it would help or not. I don't know if it would help or not. Increase conception rate eventually. To me, my gut feeling is not really, as long as the, the pygmy smells and, and shows action and is, has a high libido and can kind of, you know, go through the actions with the female, I think to me, my gut feeling is that that should be enough. Uh, maybe Whitney can, can answer it better. Um, to me, it, to me, my gut says just the smell and the sexual stimulation of the, the sho you know, the pushing and the, the shoving and the, the whole dance, so to speak, is probably more important. Good question. Very good question. In the swine industry, just I should point that on the swine industry, they use miniature pigs for heat checking as kind of the stimulus in the sow industry. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, maybe it work in the goats. Um, so as we continue on with things to think about, my goal was to, to, to talk about different ideas uh, that a person, a producer should be considering as you're 60 days out from breeding, uh, 30 days out from breeding. Because if you are gonna use a teaser ram, it takes a little time to get that ram's surgery done, to allow him to heal up for 30, 40 days uh, before you use him on use to get a semen check to make sure he's not fertile. Um, you know, there's, some of these things take time. And so you, you need to kind of 
plan out your year way ahead of time if you're going to use it. Another thing you might think about if you're going to use it and you got to think about ahead of time is the use of hormones. Uh, currently, there's some tremendous um, programs out there that as a, uh, can be used in the sheep industry to help a person's reproduction program. You can use hormones to synchronize use extremely well now. Uh, they help increase the ovulation rate and incidence of multiple births. Um, they induce fertile matings during anestrus, and you can induce early puberty. And so if you want to jumpstart your use, or if you want to get more lamb, a higher lambing percentage, or you want to do some out of season breeding, um, there's great hormonal practices out there, management practices that can be used. And those things need to kind of be planned out ahead of time. And so I'll just mention a few. Uh, a couple things that we have done here at the university. Um, two years ago, we incorporated the use of artificial insemination. We started AI in sheep, and AI has been around a long time in the cattle industry. Um, in the swine industry, about over 90% of the uh, sows in the whole American swine industry are bred via AI. Uh, but in the sheep industry, it's kind of new, so to speak. Uh, and it's really starting to become more popular, particularly with the club lamb industry, uh, the higher level show flocks of any breed out there are using AI. Uh, and in the meat goat industry, it's really, really uh, becoming a strong part of a lot of breeding programs. So we started uh, AIing about 15 ewes out of our 40 ewes. Uh, and we're gonna AI another set uh, for this year's breeding. We're gonna AI them uh, uh, end of August. So basically here in about a, another week, we're going to get them up and start flushing them and, and, and put our program into, into motion. So there's a few ways you can synchronize your user dose. The most common one would be number three, the seeders, um, a tremendous uh, technology uh, and it's very easy for producers, but there's other ways. There's the use of MGA, melangestrol acetate, and that's been used uh, it's a feed additive, and so if you're not comfortable with inserts, uh, vaginal inserts and in use, and you just don't feel comfortable with you doing that, you can certainly use melangestrol acetate. That's a feed additive. It's actually come from uh, basically the beef industry uses it quite a bit for feedlot uh, heifer rations. Um, and uh, I was on a project in grad school where we fed MGA to a set of use, and that works extremely well. And FGA, that are just sponges. You can certainly uh, use a vaginal sponge, SRA sponge, and all that is is a way to, uh, to get progesterone in their system to keep them from coming in the heat. And then once you remove the progesterone treatment um, with a combination of some other uh, hormones, you can get those used to come in all together. And usually you can AI them pretty close to each other, about 55 hours uh, in some programs after you remove uh, the sponge, okay? And so here's just the photo, and, and a lot of you might be familiar with cedars, okay? Cedars really haven't been a, around actually very long in the realm of the industry, uh, but you can see in the top left photo, that's a, it's like a T-shaped, um, a T-shaped object with a little string that comes out of the end, and that holds uh, a level of progesterone that will keep that U from coming into heat. And generally, most programs will recommend a 12 to 14 day cedar uh, implant timing. And then you'll pull the, imp pull the cedar imp uh, vaginal implant, and you might do that in combination with a shot of prostaglandin or a shot of PG600, just depending on uh, uh, your program. The top right photo uh, uh, are sponges. They do the same thing. That sponge holds a certain level of progesterone and there's a string attached, and then uh, it's a long tube, kind of an application sponge. Uh, it's a long tube, and you put the sponge in there, and uh, you enter into her uh, vagina, and you deposit that sponge. And it works just the same as a cedar, but it's a soft, spongy uh, kind of object. And once you remove that, then you can pull the cedar, and generally the female will come into estrus naturally, in those, it's about two days after you pull the cedar. And here's just a progesterone protocol uh, that uh, come from a website that was selling cedars. Um, sheep are about the same. You might use a combination. You might actually give them uh, 
you might give them a shot of a prostaglandin as well when you pull the cedar, just to make sure those females are tight in their synchrony. And so here's a protocol that actually uses another <clears throat> combination hormone, PG600. If, you, if any of you are familiar with PG600, uh, that's actually more used in the swine industry. And it's used in the swine industry to jumpstart anestrous sows. Um, and so they found that it works very well in the sheep and goat industry as well. So you see in this program, not only do you remove the cedar, on day zero, but you combine that with a shot of PG600. This is the program we use right here on campus when we go to setting up our use for AI. And so we'll put the cedar in, day 12, we'll remove the cedar, we'll combine it with a PG600 shot, and then we bring the use two days later to the AI um, clinician and they will AI our use. And so this is a really sound program can be used in both sheep and in the goat industry. Kyle? Yep. There is a question from one of our from one of our attendees. Sure. So it's a, so it's a tip for newbies, not yeah. sure about sheep, but with goats, clip the end of the ball off or they will pull it out. Great. I forgot to talk about that. Great observation. We do the same thing at school because they will pull it out. You bet. Great observation, I missed that. Um, yep, and so we clip the tails off for the little plastic strings, you bet, you bet. And the funny thing, <clears throat> I use these at home as well in my cow herd, and I, and I leave the strings on, and I very, very rarely get cows to, to pull them out of other cows, but for some reason, sheep are, are more curious, and goats must be the same way. Correct, you bet, great observation. Another system to control reproduction and to synchronize your use can be the use of prostaglandin F2 alpha. And uh, a commercial name that many of you will call it will be Lutalice, uh, but there's other types or trade names out there. Estromate is one. Uh, there used to be one called, they called it NSYNC, but essentially it was just uh, PGF2 alpha. And this program, generally does best on a two-shot sequence. And what this program does, prostaglandin causes the CL to regress. And the CL is actually uh, the organism or the part of the ovary that actually produces progesterone. So it's kind of what the, the cedar does, you know, synthetically. It's kind of what, so this is naturally where progesterone is, is secreted. And so if you can remove the CL or lyse the CL, uh, their source progesterone is now removed. And so that female will generally respond and, and start into a heat cycle or start into a, her estrus uh, coming into heat. And so a program that can be used in sheep and goats, and it does work, it's a two-shot sequence. Uh, and it's a two-shot sequence of two millimeters or two cc's, uh, generally 11 days apart. The first shot actually can be quite successful because depending on where your flock is and where they are in their estrus, uh, part of their estrus cycle, if you catch those ewes at the right time and they have a fully functional CL, you could get 60 to 70 percent will exhibit estrus after one shot. And we've had to use this um, at the barn and we use it in a different way, unfortunately, when our buck lambs jumped in with our ewes one summer. We use this to, to, to remove some unwanted pregnancies in some young ewe lambs. So it will do that the same. But if you're not comfortable with, uh, with cedars and you don't feel comfortable using uh, sponges and you want to use a different program, this program can be highly successful. You give all your ewes a shot on day one. Day 11, you come back with a second shot. And it's highly likely you're going to have the majority or a high, high, high percentage of your use will be responded to that second shot. Now all those use are going to come in heat at one time. And so with that, hopefully you have enough RAM power or if you're going to use this to set up use for AI, uh, it certainly worked for that too. So this is a two shot sequence of a prostaglandin. So as we move forward a little bit and kind of continue on some 
different, uh, different parts of a management cycle. This is kind of what we're really concerned with now here with our flock at the university is making sure our rams are, and it could be bucks too, but making sure our males are ready for a successful breeding season. You could have some terrible things and tragic losses if you don't kind of put your, get yourself put in a system where you're ready to, to turn those bucks out. We've had some, we've had some disastrous years here at the U uh, University, unfortunately, over the years with some things happening to our rams prior to breeding season, which left us short on ram power, which left us with a few more open ewes and, and those kind of things. So um, minimize your risk by having a good pre-breeding uh, management plan uh, will, will certainly hopefully ensure some more success. So some things we think about here, we're about 45 to 60 days out from maybe putting our, turning our rams in. And so some things we're thinking about here as we prepare. Whitney's gonna do a good job uh, talking about BSEs, uh, breeding soundness exams, because that I think is the number one thing that I would recommend that you do to any male that you're gonna use in your flock. Even if you set, think to yourself, well, last year he was fine, the year before he was fine. Um, well, unfortunately, that doesn't mean this year he's fine. We had a four-year-old ram, uh, five years ago, we had a four-year-old ram that we'd used for two years. And then uh, I made the uh, unfortunate assumption, well, he should be fine this year, he should be fine this year. And we put him in with the use, and he had a marking harness on, and he mounted all, he made it all 40 ewes within 17 days. And I said to one of my student shepherds, I said, we have the best buck. He covered them all tight. We're going to have a tight lambing season next year. This is going to be great. On day 18, we put a new color on the ram, and I'll talk about that. He started marking all the ewes over again. And then we said, oh, no, we got a problem. So that put me in a predicament where I had to try to find a replacement ram kind of late in the fall, late in the season. And with that, sometimes you don't get the highest quality ram. And so I learned a valuable lesson, regardless if you've used that buck for four years, three years, whatever, we need to kind of make sure a part of our preparation is that he's got a sound breeding exam and he's a viable, he's a viable buck. So here's some of the things I would recommend as you get ready for breeding season would be to trim the hooves. Uh, particularly in the summertime, sometimes if it's wet ground, they're out in the pasture, sometimes you can get some hooves that grow crooked, they grow oh, and underneath themselves. And they, so I'd be bet, you know, I'd recommend trimming their feet three weeks before turnout. And I recommend doing it at least three weeks before turnout, just in case if you quick them a little bit, um, that they have time to heal up. Sometimes when we're trimming feet, it gets a little hard to see where, how deep you want to go and how Tight, you want to bring that toe down and sometimes you can get them a little short and, and we don't want a lame buck. Okay? Observe them during the off season for any foot rot. Make sure you got that all healed up and cured before you put them out with the ewes uh, for a lot of different reasons. Shear about four to eight weeks prior to putting them out and that may depend on the time of year. Uh, summer breeding you might want to shear them a little bit tighter, a little bit closer so he's not carrying a full fleece where he could get a little overheated. Watch for flies, particularly if you do shear them tight in the summertime. Uh, that leads to potential for fly strike if you got cut during shearing. So you definitely want to make sure you keep fly spray on them so you don't have to worry about uh, any fly issues and deworm if necessary. We like to make sure our rams that we're using are hopefully a target body condition score of 3.5. And that's a little bit towards the kind of the fleshier end of the game. We don't want them obese. We don't want them in the four and a half to five scales because overly fat rams will tend to have low libido, but we don't want them overly thin and overly skinny where they're going to be, you know, not as hardy, not as tough, not as aggressive. So 3.5 is a nice condition because generally a ram's going to lose, if they're a, a very aggressive ram, they're going to lose a condition to a condition and a half score during breeding season. So a rising plane of nutrition would be definitely important. One thing I, I, I want to stress is it takes a long time to put condition on an animal. It may take you four to six weeks to even raise a body condition score because sometimes 
rams in the summertime don't eat very well to begin with. Uh, the heat might keep them from eating. So it's important to, to plan that way ahead of time. It's hard to, to take them up a week before you want to turn them out and give them all the feed they want. It just doesn't work. It's hard to get a, uh, get a, them the razor condition score. Make sure when you're making those adjustments, you do do it slowly. Uh, if you try to full feed them right from the start, you're going to run into issues with digestive problems, health issues. Uh, you could even kill them and, uh, with grain overload. So you need to kind of make that slow and steady if you need to get them up to two, three pounds a day to get that condition on. A good, good quality grain will usually do it. A good quality forage will do it. And generally one, and one, and a half, one to one and a half pounds of grain will be sufficient if it's spread over four to six weeks you can get that body condition score up. One thing we've learned that if we are gonna get their body condition score up and, 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 um, and try to get some condition on before breeding, we need to keep them in a cool place, maybe even have a fan on them, um, keep them in a place away from the ewes, otherwise they're just gonna walk the fence and wear, wear themselves down with over you know, too much exercise. And so keep them in a small pen where they can't move as much and then allows them to kind of put on some condition without running it off. Environment will definitely play a part in your ram's ability to be fertile. And so going back to that last slide, when I talked about keeping that ram in a cool place, keeping him in a comfortable uh, environment, making sure that he's not overexerting himself prior to breeding season, because the heat and humidity can definitely cause infertility in rams. And we've experienced this here on campus uh, a few summers ago uh, when it got extremely hot in August. If those of you from Minnesota, if you're online, you probably remember when the state fair a few years ago was extremely hot, over 90 degrees every day. We had one of our lead rams that summer, uh, must have got heat stressed, overheated. And when we went to turn him in in October and we did a BSE prior to breeding season, he was uh, highly infertile. He was almost shooting completely blank. And so, and I blame that on that, that heat that summer. And so with that in mind, if it's going to be hot prior to breeding season, um, particularly 60 days out from breeding season, because that's when their kind of sperm development's really taking place, um, make sure you keep your ram cool, keep fans on them if that's the possible, if you can. Now some breeds are highly adapted to heat. Most of your hair breeds uh, are highly adaptable to heat and maybe those rams probably can handle it better. But if you're dealing with Hampshire's, Columbia's, Coredales and some of the wool breeds, not quite as highly adapted to heat. And so you as a producer need to, to think about that. If it's gonna be extremely hot, do the best job you can to keep your bucks cool and, and hopefully you won't run into seasonal infertility due to heat stress. Shear your rams four to six weeks, like we mentioned. Uh, one of the little tricks you can do, and maybe some of you do this, uh, uh, if it is hot during your breeding season, I know producers that right now are breeding, uh, particularly in the club lamb industry, there's producers right now that are breeding their ewes, and they're using a night only breeding technique where they only turn the rams out at night. During the day, they're bringing their rams up, putting them in a cool barn, maybe even have a fan on them again. And then at that time, they're actually maybe even graining these bucks, to give them the opportunity to maintain condition. Um, and so that's a night only technique. Some people worry that with those night only techniques that they're used maybe, uh, they might not get as many used bred, but uh, actually the, the research has shown that the ram has plenty of opportunity to breed to use. If you go back to the first slide, a, a ewe and a doe, they're in heat, standing heat for the ram for at least 24 to 36 hours. So even if you use a night only breeding technique, that ram is gonna get plenty of opportunity uh, to come in contact with that ewe that's standing and he, he will not miss her. But that'll certainly help. And it's a technique that we've actually used here at the college uh, a couple times when we start breeding, even in September, some of those days can get a little warm. So ram to ewe ratio is something that needs to be considered. Uh, especially as you move forward, make sure that you have enough ram power. Uh, that may depend on the season of the year, uh, summer, fall, winter, or spring. Uh, the age of the ram, uh, are you using ram lambs versus using 
older rams. We tend to use it at the college. We use tend to use a lot of ram lambs uh, because the new ram lambs tend to have a little more current genetics. So we try to use a more current buck. Uh, and so that'll be uh, something we'll have to consider uh, as we think about how many use that rams are going to cover. And if you use estrus synchronization techniques, particularly if you're synchronizing estrus and you want all your ewes to come in at a tight pattern, you want them all to come in at the same time, you're going to have to have quite a bit of ram power because those bucks will just get overly worked and uh, they won't get as many ewes bred as tight because there's so many ewes coming in heat at one time. So here's kind of the recommended ram to ewe ratios. This will be different. If you look, this is out of a sheep production kind of textbook I use in my classes, but it, it may be a little bit different depending on breeds. But for the most part, a one to 50 ratio is kind of, you'll see that printed in print a lot, a one to 50 ratio uh, for like summer breeding, August, September breeding, a one to 50 ratio will be uh, really a good sound number. Spring breeding, if you want to try to get out of season lambs, oftentimes those bucks aren't quite as fertile in the spring as they come out of the winter. And so a one to 35 may be a more desirable number to shoot for. Ram lambs, a one to 15 to one to 30 ratio is kind of a nice guide to go. I, I do know some producers that try to push those older ram lambs, um, one to 40, one to 45. Uh, I just was talking to a producer out that I know from travel and uh, he uses his mature rams at a one to 100 ratio. Um, and that's pushing, now he's using Rambolet cross rams, but that's pushing a ram pretty hard, but he, he feels that ram is, was able to do that. And then synchronized matings, um, a one to five to one to 10 again, because all those ewes are tight uh, in their estrus uh, cycle and they're all gonna cycle very close. And so to have enough ram power uh, to cover all those ewes at one time, you're gonna have to uh, probably double or triple the rams you're using. So fertile adult rams can mate at least five ewes per day. Um, and so they are, they do have the ability to mate quite a few ewes in a day. So over a 34 day breeding season, which would be two cycles, one ewe could possibly mate over 150 ewes. And, and there are stories and there's producers and maybe some producers that are online right now that do use rams at that heavy of a breeding rate. Uh, but for the most part, your typical breeds, your Midwestern meat breeds are one to 50 is a nice number to shoot for. You could run into problems because the thing about ewes is they, even though you think they'd spread out their cycles evenly distributed over a 17 day period, they don't really do it that way. They tend to cluster their estrus. And so a ram may breed five ewes in a day and then he may take a day off and then the next day, two days later, another five. And so they kind of can cluster to different parts of their cycle and not quite as evenly spread out. Our ewes last year, for example, out of our 40 ewes we bred, um, the majority of them got bred within the first six, seven days. And it was very, very light in the last four or five days of the heat cycle. So they were all kind of clustered to the front. So it's recommended again, probably to keep your RAM services to at least five or less per day in order to, to, to get acceptable conception rates. Ram lambs are maybe a little different again. That'll kind of depend on the age of your ram lamb. Uh, if you're using springborn ram lambs that are just seven months old, six to seven months old, 15 ewes might be enough for that ram lamb to ensure that he gets them all bred and gets them all bred in a timely manner. If you're using a fall ram lamb that's going to be turning a year old when he starts to breed that following fall, he may be older, he may be larger and bigger and more growthier, and uh, he may be able to handle 30 ewes, maybe even up to 40 ewes, depending on how comfortable you feel. But definitely the most important part would be that you watch those rams, particularly ram lambs, and make sure that you observe them every day for their, their, their breeding behavior. Are they marking ewes? And unfortunately, there are ram lambs that just maybe get overwhelmed when they get thrown in with the use, and they kind of maybe get a little scared and nervous and they just go lay in the corner and they, they get kind of overwhelmed by all those use, particularly if you use ram lambs on a set of older mature use, those older mature use, they'll be pretty rough with those ram lambs sometimes and they'll, 
you know, they're in heat and they want to be bred. And so they'll kind of push those ram lambs around and, and get a little physical. And we've had a ram lamb or two over the years that just get a little bit shell shocked and overwhelmed. And they kind of get a little scared and want to go lay in the corner. So it's important to watch those lamb, rams, particularly your ram lambs, to make sure that they are marking and they are settling your ewes. <clears throat> now, group mating in your larger flocks. Um, yeah. When you group, Kyle. Yep. Yeah. One one second. So, just a comment from a, an attendee. Okay. An odd number of rams is good to use because there's uh, because one is always not fighting and doing his job as a man sure. technique. Sure. Yeah. I don't actually have as much experience in running groups. We don't run groups here at the college. We actually have enough barn space where we actually uh, use one ram per one small group of ewes. But that's a very good observation when you run them in large groups together, like this slide we're gonna talk about. Um, that's a great, a great uh, thing to point out. I, I don't have as much experience with that. Um, I would say though, running lambs and mature rams together generally is not recommended in the same breeding group. Um, because the older rams will tend to dominate and may injure the younger rams. So I would recommend you kind of keep them aged upright. And that's a good point to put them in odd numbers uh, to keep, maybe to keep, you know, keep the fighting to a minimum or at least keep one that's not fighting. The funny thing is if you do some research on, on, on running group sires, it's kind of interesting there's a few papers out there that talk about running groups together, like a group of bulls, a group of rams. And it's kind of interesting. One paper I read about said that one of the sires out of the group of five sires they had in the pasture, one sire, they did DNA on all the lambs. And one sire was the sire of over 65% of the lambs. So you will get a dominant male that will tend to do most of the breeding, even in group situations. Which is a good thing from the standpoint if you are a commercial breeder and your main priority is to get ewes bred and you're not as concerned with the sires particularly, um, running group together you ensure yourself a higher percentage of them will get bred because even if one of the bucks out of the group of the males turns out to be infertile and he's not a very good breeder, the other ones will make up for that. The other ones will make up for and so just some advice to house the rams together for a few days, get them used to each other, mix them together in small pins to keep them from getting the long distances to charge and, and limit that fighting. And once they get used to each other, then they'll be ready to go out as a group. Ram marking harness, uh, this would probably be other than a BSE. Um, as my number one recommendation. This would be my number two recommendation from a standpoint of having a ram marking harness on your, on your males can tell you so much information that you'll, you'll need and you'll find extremely valuable. And so you can buy these ram marking harnesses at any veterinary supply company. There's many different kinds on the market. There's some that are made out of leather, some that are made out of just like a strap cloth material. Um, they all kind of serve a good purpose and you might find some that work better than others. We have about two or three different kinds uh, in our barn and they all work effective. And what we, what this allows us to do is, is when you harness up a buck and you turn them out during breeding season, it allows you to observe a lot of things. You first of all can write down every day that a, a ewe is bred. And with that, you can kind of project forward a, a, to the day she's gonna lamb. So it definitely allows you that. It allows you to know if the ram is fertile, if the ewe is fertile. It allows you to kind of get a good sense on the fertility of your flock. Did they all breed up tight? Or did they get extended over two or three heat cycles? And so it allows you to know a lot about your flock. Um, one thing about these marking harnesses, what you, what you wanna do, you wanna change the color every 17 days. And what I would recommend is always start with the light color. So we start with yellows. 
And then the next color we do is orange. And then the last color we do is either a dark blue or a black. We run our rams for three heat cycles and then we pull the bucks and then we will preg check later on and who's ever open uh, gets called. And so ideally, I would love to have all our ewes lamb as tight as we can early in the breeding season. But this definitely gives you that opportunity to monitor that. As those bucks do mate use, I would also tell you to keep a good close eye on the marking harness because they'll lose weight. And eventually a tight marking harness, 30 days into the breeding season can now become a loose marking harness because they just lose body weight. And so you might have to readjust that marking harness every time you put a new crayon uh, into the holster. Some of the marking harnesses are made a little bit different. Some, they, some get a little close to the armpits and will go under the kind of the armpits of the rams. And we found, uh, unfortunately, some of the marking harnesses can get a little bit sharp and start chafing the rams underneath the marking harness. And so we've had to take vet wrap or some sort of uh, protective wrap and wrap it around the marking harnesses underneath the armpits of these rams because it can chafe them and cut them up to a point where those rams don't even want to walk, don't even want to stand. Um, and so be aware of you know, always monitoring your marking harnesses that you put on the ram to make sure they're still fitting properly, that the chalk is down there below us into a sternum area and that it's properly working. Also be aware that when you buy these colors, the colors are also made in, uh, for different temperatures. Um, you can get an all season marking crayon, which works for, for a wider range of temperature, but they also make more specifically, they make cool temperature, medium temperature and hot temperature. And if you feel those crayons, the temperature, they're softer and harder. Okay, the hot weather ones are pretty hard, the soft weather, the cold weather ones are pretty soft. So if you use the wrong one and the wrong temperature, you could get to a point where they're actually, the crayon doesn't even come off. If you're using a hard marking one uh, in the cold weather, it won't even come off on the U. And you're gonna say to yourself, wow, he's got a brand new crayon on and he doesn't mark any U's. He must not be working. Well, he may be, he's breeding all of them, but the crayon uh, just isn't coming off. Okay, so be aware that they, the crayons come in different temperature ranges too. Also be aware that and I tell my students this that work for me, if that buck, the first few few days, first three or four days is really active, he could use a whole crayon up in that first few days. So make sure you're ready to change that crayon uh, if he uses it a lot. Now, okay, as we finish up, I'm just gonna talk about some um, other reproductive uh, techniques or reproductive management that is out there. The use of artificial insemination, uh, really strong in the swine industry, very strong in the dairy industry, and it's getting more and more use in the sheep industry and particularly in the goat industry as well. Uh, as it becomes a better technique, people are better at doing it and we're getting better success. So we use artificial insemination on campus uh, on some of our best high quality use uh, so we can breed them to some of the best rams in America to, to make uh, improvement. Artificial insemination in the commercial sheep industry probably isn't a use as much uh, on a large scale, uh, but in some of the more elite niche markets, it's being used and allows you to use some of the best tech, uh, best genetics, some of the best rams in America. Uh, what makes it difficult in sheep and goats is that they don't show visual signs of heat or the actual standing estrus as easy. Whereas in cows and, and pigs, you can see it, you can walk into a pen and know that animal, like females in heat. Sheep may ride each other a little bit, does may ride each other, but for the most part, they're, they're very silent. Another thing that makes it hard is they have a complicated cervix, uh, transcervical AI, which is used in cattle, swine, and goats, uh, is very challenging in the sheep industry. Uh, so what they generally use in the sheep industry and in a lot of the meat goat industry, they may even use laparoscopic AI. And all that is, is um, basically a small incision made, in the, made in, the, in the lower body wall, where they basically will deposit the semen directly in the horns. And um, 
it's actually a very minimal non-invasive surgery. It can be done very quickly. Um, and basically I'll show you a picture here. Um, takes about two to five minutes. Um, most of these technicians that do large scale AI of sheep uh, can even get that time down to one to two minutes per view. Once they get them in the stanchions that you is upside down, uh, her left hind legs are extended. They make a couple small incision. He goes in with a, basically a scope. He can find the uterine horns and deposit his semen uh, in these ewes. And generally, these ewes have been synchronized with a uh, synchronization program to set them up to all be in their correct stage uh, of timing uh, reproductively in order for them to be conceived. And you can get high conception rates, generally 50 to 80% with laparoscopic AI. So the technique, uh, the whole AI industry is, is growing in the sheep industry. It's growing in the meat goat industry uh, and it's becoming more and more prevalent uh, that producers are using this technique. And so you will use a synchronization program. And this is very similar to the AI program I showed you earlier. Um, synchronizing you um, 60 hours after you pull your cedar, you'll in, uh, you inject your PG600, uh, you'll get that you and you can actually just AI or off of time. Some people might run a teaser buck to mark those use, particularly if you're gonna be AIing with really expensive semen, you might even run a teaser buck with these use and, and let that teaser buck mark those use so you know without a doubt that that you was in standing heat. Because if you're gonna use very high, uh, very, very expensive semen, you wanna make sure you're putting that semen into a U that you know without a doubt has been in heat. If you're not using very expensive semen and you're just using uh, AIing a large group with commercial AI semen, uh, you may just may time breed them. That's what this program is, it's a time breeding system. I'll finish up with a couple slides here on embryo transfers. Uh, those of you that are online and, and maybe are familiar with the meat goat industry, um, this is becoming very, very popular amongst the elite meat goat breeders. And all they are is basically utilizing a technique that's been around in the beef industry for many, many years. And they're uh, super ovulating their females. And this works in the sheep industry too. They're super ovulating their females. And from the superovulation, they can gather a large quantity of eggs and they'll take those eggs, they'll use a surgical technique, they'll, they'll, they'll flush those ewes. Um, it's a little bit more intricate than, a, than using a transcervical flush like they do in the cattle industry. Uh, generally, that's a surgery involved. Uh, and they'll remove the embryos and then they'll put them in a large set of recipient ewes or recipient does. And this is a technique that again would be used by your large scale uh, purebred breeders that are trying to multiply some of the most high end, high quality females that they'd have on their ranches and their flocks. Well, that's my part. Uh, Dr. Whitney will, will kind of visit with you more about the B BSEs and those kind of things. Does anyone have any questions as I finish up here? Kyle, we do have some questions that have come up in the chat that haven't been answered yet. Okay. So one is, if you choose to use Ludolice, forgive me if the pronunciation yep. is wrong. Um, okay. Um, on your use for ovulation, would you still need to flush the use prior to breeding? Yes, that, yes, that would be, yep, I would definitely flush them because the flushing will increase may increase the ovulation rate. So more likely to get your twins or your multiple births. The lutolice will just, um, it'll just lice the CL in essence, setting their hormonal system in a sequence where they'll actually come into standing heat. So that has nothing really related to what they did up to that point with the flushing. So they're kind of maybe two things that work together. They're not as related, but they'll work together to encourage you to have a larger litter sizes. So yes, I would flush them up to that point. The little lice is just gonna help you bring them into heat when you want them to come into heat. Correct. 
All right, thanks. Um, and actually, the other one that I had actually has been answered now. So if there are any other questions, you can put those in the chat in the next couple of seconds here. Otherwise, we can move over to Dr. Whitney. Hey, Claire, we had one question that I didn't quite get to in the chat. Sure. Uh, the question was about the cost difference between AI versus mm -hmm. owning a RAM or buck. And uh, my, my initial answer is that, that it, it, it depends on the size of your flock. If you only have six to 10 or five to 10 ewes, then, then it's a very much different question than if you have 100. Uh, do you have any comments on that, Kyle? Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, let's just say you have, you know, Commercial rams out in the industry will range anywhere from $300 to say $1,000 to buy a high quality commercial ram. So you'll keep that ram four or five years maybe and you spread them over a hundred use. The math will say maybe it's, it costs you four or five, six dollars per you to breed. You know, if you do some math and spread out ram power versus your use. So I would, tell most people when they ask me this question, I get this sometimes when I'm at fairs and stuff. If you want an AI, and if you want to use some of the best bucks in the industry, it's going to cost you two to $300 a straw semen. So to make one U, one time, you're going to have two to $300 in that U in semen cost. And so I probably, you know, I would recommend a small producer still needs a buck and a large producer will need bucks. Um, there's much, much more cost into AIing sheep than there is to run a natural sire. Much more cost. The cattle industry has, in the dairy industry, they've been able to get that semen cost down to a point where it can be competitive with buying natural herd sires. Um, the swine industry can get semen costs far lower than buying natural sires nowadays. But for some reason, the sheep industry cost of semen is pretty high on some of these rams and these, these bucks that it'd be very difficult to, to make it pay uh, and try to beat the cost of using natural sires. Um, and so did that answer your question? Yeah, I think that covered that covered it for sure. I, the only thing I'll add to that uh, is that a lot of times there's other factors for why you may or may not want to ram or buck around. So oh. if if you if you're worried about safety or you've got kids or things like that, you know maybe you can justify that difference in cost if if there's other factors that that don't play into the economics. Yeah, that's a good point. I had a producer called me once and he had 10 U's and he was really inquiring about AI. And I told him, I said, you know, even with AI, as good as these veterinarians are nowadays with AI, um, they're still only going to get 80% bred. And so you're still going to have to have something there if you want to breed those other ones. You're either going to have to get a buck in there or you're going to have to ship them, you know, as open. So you're still gonna have to have a male around. And you're right about potential for injury and bucks can get mean and stuff. So that could be a concern. Um, then you hopefully can use a younger ram or try to find a docile ram or something, but you're gonna still have opens. As good as AI is, you're still gonna have, you're gonna have those ewes that are gonna to have to be cleaned up with a natural sire. And that's what I told him um, when he called me. So yeah, that, that's a good point. A good point. Kyle? Kyle. Um, yeah. yeah, so there was a question about are there any pointers or tips when working with fin sheep? The attendee has heard it was a good breed for breeding. Well, fin sheep are, are very, very prolific, and that's a breed that's known for having multiple births. In fact, more than two. I mean, threes and fours and fives. And so, um, uh, you know, just be prepared to, with fin sheep, that maybe you'll have a few more orphan lambs than you would with other breeds. Um, 
they are a very high milking breed as well. So you make sure, I would recommend probably to monitor condition and make sure that these ewes that are produ raising three, four lambs, if they're doing it, that you make sure you give them enough groceries so they don't get too thin on you um, and cause some problems there. Uh, but a wonderful breed, highly maternal, um, very known for their milking ability, the ability to have large litters. And so because of that inherent production level, they're so good at that. You gotta monitor nutrition and you gotta be, probably be willing to raise a few orphan lambs every once in a while. I should say orphan extra lambs that the mother can't keep up with. If they have so many lambs. Yeah. So Kyle, with that, this kind of follows up with that question, you know, cause I, a great ag teacher but how if you're new to the industry and even if you've had some experience where do you learn about the different breeds of sheep and what one would work well on their farm uh, what are some ideas and some observations you would have for our audience to look at the breeds of sheep and and goats really for that matter too how do they get their information um that's a good point. I mean, information can come from a lot of different areas. Um, you know, certainly now with such an ease of, of finding good information on the on the internet, um, breeders websites, breeding system websites, great university uh, websites. Um, you know, I think if a person was going to decide what breed they want, how they want to get into it, I think you need to put the end point in front of the first day. So what do you want to do with these sheep? And Wayne is going to, he's talking to me about a, a webinar he was going to put together on marketing. You know, what's your final goal? And what do you want to do with those animals? I mean, I think if you want to ray, if you want to be in the fiber industry, then you're going to gear towards a fiber breed. If you want to be in the meat industry selling uh, freezer lamb, you're going to gear towards a breed that's known for more muscling. Um, if you don't want to mess with shearing, if you don't want to mess with parasites, you may, parasite treatment, I guess, or control, you might gear towards a hair breed. Uh, you kind of maybe put the end point in front of the front point, I guess. A lot of people pick a breed because they like the way they look and they saw pictures of them on the internet. And then when they get them, they may realize, well, what am I going to do with them? I got no end point. I have no market for them. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. We chose Hampshire's here years ago at the University of Minnesota, but just strictly because of the opportunity to sell uh, lamb through our meat store and, 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 uh, and to raise lambs for meat production. So that kind of geared what breed we're into, but so much information now that a guy, a guy, a gal could get online and, and talk to neighbors. You might realize after living in an area for a while, like why are all the neighbors raising this breed of sheep? Uh, why are all the neighbors geared towards this industry? Well, there could be a market there. There could be an industry in that area that caters to wool or caters to this type of sheep. But there's so many good resources online. Probably one of the best one, I just saw someone make a comment, Travis, my good friend, Oklahoma State has a wonderful breeds website. It talks about the pros and cons of every breed and some of their attributes and, and uh, their niches. So you know, you maybe just kind of think about your end point before you, you fall in love with a breed because you're in, you still have to use this hopefully as a form of income or a way to, to hopefully make them pay for themselves a little bit. Anybody else? Thanks, yes. Are there any other questions? Um, that are burning. Otherwise, we'll move on to Whitney here. 